Hello, good morning, and welcome to Pinedale Christian Church, Tuesday morning Bible study time, the spanky, sparky, and spunky show, and spunky, you look like you're, you're spunky this morning. You look like you're ready to go. I'm on it. I'm on it. girl, yeah, very good, sparky, and you're equally ready to roll. Uh, not as much as she is, but I'm getting there. Very good. We don't do this often enough, but just in case anybody out there or somebody here might, Bill McKenzie. Minister Emeritus, Lisa Hamrick, and Danny Spainauer. Good to have you guys. Love uh, what we get to do here on Tuesday mornings. And if you've been uh, around on Tuesday mornings, I know you're a fan of the first part of this Tuesday morning. And so here we yeah. go. Yeah, they, they get five more minutes of sleep, you'll be smart. No, no, no. They're a fan of this. You know, Bill, old Ben Franklin uh, once said, you may have remembered when this came out in the newspaper the first time. <laughs> Uh, old Ben Franklin once said, our Constitution is now established. Everything seems to, promi- to, be, to promise it will be durable, but in this world, nothing is certain except... Death and taxes. Death and taxes. There we go. I thought since yesterday was tax day here in the good old U.S. of A, that we could probably find some very interesting trivia wrapped up around that fun day. And so here we go. Whatever you do, don't say something that gets us audited. Okay. okay. Do not get audited. I think all this is, think all this is clean. Here we go. Which has more words? Which document has more words? The King James Bible. War and peace are the federal tax code. I'm going to say the tax code. <laughs> this, this is a gimme putt, man. All right, well, then if it's a gimme putt, then you're going to say as well. Absolutely the tax code. Tax code, very good. All right, rank those three. The King James Bible, war and peace, and the federal tax code. And I'll as far go, as. I'll go with war and peace second. All right, war and peace second. What are you going to say? The Bible. That uh, is first? It's first. It's first. Actually, War and Peace is first with 560,000 words. The King James Bible has 788,280 words. And the federal tax code has 1,193,400 words. I didn't count them, so I can't promise you that's an exact number. I'm just using a number that I found online. My accountant has read every one of those, too. Oh, I hope your accountant has. All right, here's an interesting kind of sad fact. In 2023, just last year, Americans collectively had to work until which day of the calendar year to pay the country's tax burden? So how long did all Americans have to work last year to cover the country's tax burden, if we kind of put it in those terms. I don't know about that last year, but in recent years, somewhere along the way, it was in May sometime. Okay. What do you think? Our July. June, July. See, I don't know. Well, no, y'all aren't going to like these numbers then. I don't what know. I had for last year was April the 18th. We all had to work 108 days to cover the country's tax burden. Well, April that state taxes and stuff too. I'm, I'm, I just remember something that was in May. I don't remember about, I didn't look at that. That was according to the Tax Foundation. They, had, they have a day in which they announce it and so on. It's like happy tax-free day for right? the rest That's, of the year. You're... I can ask you this question by a state-by-state basis. Which state residents had to work the longest? Which state's residents had to work the longest? So who has the most taxes in the U.S.? California. New York or California. I said it, New York. There you go. New York had to work till May the 3rd. And who had the least amount of taxes? Who got finished first as far as working for the man? Alaska. Ah, very good. March 25th, Alaska. Don't mess with him. He is on. How many states do not have income tax? Well, I don't know that one. There's nine of them. I'm 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 sorry. There's nine of them. And I could ask you these questions, but I'll just go ahead and give you the answers. Here we go. In New Mexico, you don't have to pay taxes if you're over 100 years old. (laughs) 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 You get to 100, move to New Mexico, and there you go. Uh, What state has a blueberry tax? A blueberry tax? A blueberry tax, yes. Somebody's already said it. Maine. Blueberries are so important to its agricultural economy, the state of Maine imposes a special tax on blueberries, and it helps avoid over-harvesting, all right? And this is one you'd never guess, which state has a playing card tax? So if you buy a deck of cards, who's going to tax you? I'll take a wild guess at Nevada. That's everybody's (laughs) guess, but that's not it. For some reason, it's the state of Alabama. It's the only state in the United States that charges an extra 10 cents 
tax on a deck of playing cards, all right? But wait, that's not it, there's more. <laughs> In the state of New York, once your bagel is sliced, it's considered prepared food and is subject to sales tax. So if you go to New York, take your bagel whole, all right? <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> While disposable diapers are subject to sales tax in Wisconsin, cloth diapers are not. In Texas, cowboy boots are exempt from sales tax. Hiking boots are not. U.S. citizens didn't pay federal income tax until the Civil War, and finally, Cigarette tax is the third highest tax paid by Americans, and I saw this quote and thought it was funny. Cigarettes tax is the third highest amount to, uh, of tax paid by Americans, followed closely by court fees and taxes paid to obtain dog license. In other words, we're just a bunch of smoking, law-breaking dog lovers. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. And if you think, hang on, and if you think our taxes you are bad. You stop. You got to laugh, man. You I know. Here's one more. <laughs> he's, he's on it. Up until February 2021, if you think our taxes are bad, up until February 2021, tax fraud was a capital offense and punishable by death in China. So don't <laughs> mess with, our taxes aren't that bad, folks. There you go. Hey, Jeff, could you all cut a song out because we've used a little while here <laughs> on Danny's opening stupid stuff. No, I want him to make a song saying, we're a smoking, law-breaking dog lover. <laughs> I want you to come up with that. It sounds like a good country song, doesn't it? Does. It's, got, it's got potential. There we go. All right, there's your tax trivia for this morning, and off we go. Let's pray for somebody. <laughs> Did you all come to hear that? I mean, I'm just yes. curious. I mean, these people it's lost the good stage. stuff. It's, it's good stuff. Stage. Okay. Don't buy blueberries in Maine. Oh boy, you loosen this up. Attaboy. I got the okay. audience in. Okay. Here we go. Okay. All right. We have a, a praise. And Hard to make that transition, isn't it? Really, I have to get myself together. Which gears? Um, Hal had surgery uh, this past week, and he's doing great. He's at home. I spoke with Nina, and she showed me some really cute pictures of him, and he's coming right along. And we would also like to lift up Joe. He has been hospitalized recently. You know, he has a lot of breathing difficulties, and apparently there's not a lot the doctors can do. So we just want to continue to lift up Joe. He's a special part of our group. He doesn't, he's not able to, be, to come recently because of his health, but we would like to lift him up. And we also would like to lift up Ron, who is having an endoscopy and colonoscopy this afternoon. And Joan is having a procedure at Novant this afternoon. So there's a lot of procedures this we would like to cover. And a friend of Joan H.'s is having a triple bypass in Lynchburg. So we would like to lift her friend up as well. Yep. Anything else? So we're good. Let's open up a prayer. God, we thank you for another Tuesday morning when we can come together and catch up. And I just love Tuesday mornings. I think this is church. This is what they did in Acts chapter two. They did life together. So we get to come in, we get to catch up with each other, see new friends, meet new folks. And uh, Lord, right now we get to pray for our folks and our friends and ourselves. And Lord, we have a, quite a long prayer list, but especially we wanna pray for those two or three today that are going through procedures. Uh, Lord, it's always, oh, it's just a routine surgery until it's on you. And I pray that for those two or three that are going through the procedures that we know, that's exactly what it is, it's routine. That the surgeons and everyone, do, they do exactly what they're supposed to do. And then Lord, as the great physician, we ask that you be with them. And uh, Lord, restore their health, if that's your will. But that's kind of our prayer, to get them back here as quickly as possible so we can continue doing life together. Lord, I thank you for just this time of year when um, kind of spring and turning and changing seasons, reminding us you're still on the throne, you're still in control, you're still watching after us, and for that, Lord, we're thankful. And so this morning, Lord, as we come, I just pray that we can kind of set everything aside. Uh, maybe this past week's been tough, and Lord, just help us to set that aside. Maybe we've got some things coming up this next week that we're worried about, but Lord, help us just to set all that aside, and for the next while, just worship and focus on you. God, you're so good to us, and for that, we're thankful, and we want to worship you right now. So Lord, will you be with us this morning? as we worship you now in song, around the table, and then as we dive into your word. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things this morning. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we hope that you're wide awake, but we're going to start off today. We're going to have you stand, and we want you to put your hands together because we're going to play through this first song one time before we start singing. So stand up, and uh, if you don't put your hands together, we may have you come up and sing with us. We don't know. 
So I'm going to be watching. All right? Okay, let's, let's, let's put our hands together and let's worship. Singing as I 
Blessed did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. Good evening, both that sacred end for such a worm as I. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there. seated. 
be asked to come to lead the communion meditation. And um, today I want to share a couple of things with you. Like all of us, when we did our 40-day devotionals, I really, I really got a lot out of the study from, from the book of John. And as we continue to read about the upper room and the discussions and the emotions and all the things that Jesus was trying to teach the disciples, what the disciples were asking, the confusion. And it was just, it was just a very great study, and I'm so thankful to be a part of that. Since that has, has ended, I've continued to read through, through John's gospel, and I wanted to share something that I read a, a few days ago, and, it, and see if we can tie this into communion. It's uh, the 21st chapter of John, and it talks about Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples got together one evening. Peter says, look, I'm going out to go fish. The other says, well, you know what? We'll go with you. So they went out, they got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So ladies, I'm getting ready to give you a secret that the guys don't want you to know about us. This is how men have group therapy. You know, they went out, they did an activity they were comfortable doing with people they were really comfortable with. And I really don't think it was just to go pick up some fish. You see, you got to remember, they had just seen Jesus accused, tried, wrongly convicted, crucified, buried, and then the resurrection. But this part of the scripture doesn't say anything about Jesus was there during this conversation. So you got these disciples, these guys that's been together through the most life-changing event in the world. And Peter says, look, I, I, I'm going fishing. And his buddy says, we're going with you. So can you imagine five or six guys in a boat on the water for several hours? And it says they caught nothing. Well, what do you figure the guys did during all this? Unlike what ladies probably don't think happened, there probably was a lot of conversations going on. There was probably a lot of questions. What did Jesus mean by this? Well, do you think he really said this? And see, unlike us, if we've got questions, we got the Bible we can go back and refer to. What exactly did Jesus say? It's not like they could look at John and say, John, roll back the scroll a few bit and tell us exactly what he said. They've got to think, did he really say that? What did he mean by that? They're out here fishing. You know, maybe the guys in this room, maybe our activity where we get our group therapy is not fishing. Maybe it's tinkering around with some old cars with a couple of buddies. Maybe it's a landscaping project where two or three guys get together and they cut grass, they build landscape areas, things like that. Maybe it's through sports. Maybe it's through softball. Maybe it's through golf. Maybe it's through just getting together and watching a ball game. But what guys do during this activity, that's where we talk about the things on our heart. So ladies, I'm letting you know, sometimes when we go do these activities, it's not about the activity. It's about our group therapy. So let's read a little bit further because the Bible says they call nothing. So there's a whole lot of conversations going on. It says early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. It says, but the disciples did not realize that it was actually Jesus standing there. He, Jesus, called out to them, friends, have you caught any fish? No was the reply. Okay, stop right there. I'm on the boat with my buddies, caught no fish for several hours, and somebody on the shore, hey, did you catch anything? I'm probably not excited to hear from you. You know, you're going to tell me now how to do my job. But he did. Jesus, well, try this. Jesus says, throw your net out on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. Anybody else find that interesting? They went all night and never tried the right side of the boat? Huh. I'm sure they tried the right, the left, the front, the back, but they didn't catch any fish because it wasn't time for them to catch the fish. But they did what they were told to do by some unknown voice that they didn't recognize was the Savior of the world. They didn't recognize it was Jesus. Okay, whatever you say there on the shore, we're going to try it your way. They throw the net over. We all know what happened. Lots and lots and lots of fish. 
I think the Bible says it was around 153. At that point, one of the disciples put together the voice and put together where the direction was coming from. It was Jesus. And Peter, as Peter can only do, jumps out of the boat and off he goes. And they all get to shore and they finally get there. And when they get there, Jesus says, look, looks at them and says, bring some of the fish that you've caught. So Peter climbs back into the boat, drags, helps drag this at a shore. And at this point, Jesus already had the fire ready. Jesus already had the coals prepared. Jesus was ready for communion and was just simply waiting on them. Maybe that's where we are here today. Jesus is simply ready. Jesus is simply waiting on you and me to take our time together today for communion. So as one group, let's do that. Let's take that, which represents Jesus' body, and let's partake of that remembering Jesus. And now the juice, which represents his life-giving, sin-forgiving blood. Can I lead us in prayer? Almighty God, we come to you today, Lord, through the powerful name of Jesus and with the guiding of the Holy Spirit to say thank you. And the Lord say, help us to always be ready to have communion with you, whether it's in our church sitting, Lord, whether it's in our homes, or it's sitting in our cars, or may our spirit be in sweet communion with you. Guide us and direct us throughout the remainder of our time together here as we open, study, and read your word. And in all things, Lord, we might bring you honor and glory. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. All right, first of all, great, awesome, well done, sir. Thank you, Tracy, for leading us to communion time. Excellent. I did have a problem with it. Well, you, He's well, telling you secrets. He's telling secrets. <laughs> He's telling all the boys' secrets to the girls. Well, we're supposed to keep that stuff quiet, Tracy. Come on, man. That's awesome. Well that done, sir. That is kind of dangerous, isn't it? I know. I hope Marcy's not listening. <clears throat> well done, sir. Well done, well done, well done. All right, we're ready to roll? We are ready so. to roll. Here we go. Tuesday afternoons, I send an update out with some slides from this morning. I send our prayer list out. I send announcements out. If you'd like to get on that list and you're not on that list, if you'll send me an email at dspainhour at pinedale.org or pinedale.church, uh, it'll get here and say, hey, put me on the list. I'll put you on the list. Or there's my cell phone number, or you can call the church office, and we'll be happy to get you on that update list. So that's that. Two or three things I want to announce. Uh, when you came in, uh, you probably saw a copy of our directory. Here's a, a black and white, just so I can remind myself of it. But we are uh, a couple, I hope, a couple weeks away from publishing our directory, pretty much for our Tuesday morning crew. And uh, so if you would please, if you haven't already checked it, we printed this one off so you could look at your picture and see if you're pretty enough. I, <laughs> there's no more hope for you, sir. We'd start to just put Marcy and the dog. We want that picture, actually. We want, we want Marcy and Rip. Rip, and we're going to put that one in the director for Getting you guys. Get ready to have a facelift and a few other things altered. Do you think that will help? Then we won't recognize you. It's like, who's that guy? But anyway, look in the book back there. Look at your picture. Look at the address and the phone number. That's what we really want you to look at. Email address, phone number, and all that good stuff. Make sure everything's correct because we're getting ready to print this thing. Every year we print this thing. As soon as we hand it out, it's <laughs> messed up. But we're trying. And also there is a local service directory. A lot of times we get phone calls about, hey, do we know a good this or know a good that in the church? And we're putting that together, and that book's out there as well. If you, if you have a service that you provide, you can put that in that book. And um, what I hope to do is put these two together and then hand them out in a couple of weeks. So that's that, the directory. If you're new, you're welcome to put your name in there, and we'll get your picture and all that good stuff. So just kind of stop by there on the way out, if you don't mind, because this is about two weeks away from being printed. Uh, and then the final thing is, uh, that I have is uh, Renew in the Smokies. This is... Senior adult, for me, it's summer camp for big kids. 
and uh, it is coming up. We're going May 27th through June 31st, and I have to send the registration in next week. So we're here. I can go through next Tuesday, and then I need to send it in. But uh, we have, I think, 16 signed up now. If you're interested in this, it is a great week of Bible study and worship time on a beautiful campus. Uh, we leave here on a Monday morning, go up. It starts Monday night, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's a full day of Bible studies, and they have a concert coming this year. And then in the afternoon, you're free. And they have hiking trips and different things, or you can just go take a nap. So whatever you want to do. And then we come home on Friday. But it is a great week. If you'd like to go or you have questions about it, let me know. But that's coming up. Uh, the deadline to sign up for that is coming up. And uh, we need to do that by next Tuesday. So I wanted to remind you of that. So good stuff going on there. I think that's it. We had a great time at the Wolford House last Thursday. We took uh, 30 people up and uh, sang all the, these songs we knew. Uh, we didn't know about four or five. I think Judy and I had a competition to see who, if we didn't know some songs. And there were some songs we did not know. So, and I think Judy won. She knew more than I did. But Was it because they were hillbilly or because they were oldie, oldie, oldies? They were oldie, 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 oldies. Oldie, 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 oldies. Yeah. And I think, and then a couple were, I think were new. So it was, but it was all good. So that was good. So I had a good time. Uh, I, I heard a few other comments from it too. Everybody seemed to have a great time and so on. And yep behaved for change and so on? I pretty much behaved. I'm, uh, when we drove up, there was a, a Baptist bus and I think one other church bus. And I said, y'all just blend in with them and don't, don't, you know, we'll just, if somebody asks you where you're from, say First Baptist. You yeah. saw them on the, on the highway or, or? No, they were there at the place with us. They were at the Wolford House with us. And I said, just act like them. So we were all good. <sighs> yeah. It was all good. We had a fun time. That's always good advice. Yeah. Always. <laughs> When in doubt, deflect. Right, you done? I am done. All right, let's, let me get you started and us started and so on, whatever. All right, I'm going to call this one of the best things I saw last week, and it's not one of the best things I saw last week, except you have to see it through the eyes that I'm looking at it, and that is this. I know you all were watching on the, uh, the news this past week when uh, war, in a sense, moved closer to the edge as far as the Middle East is concerned. They're already certainly in, involved in a war, but, but uh, this past week, uh, one bright night, uh, the nation of Iran decided that they were going to pick a fight with Israel, and they were doing it under the disguise of, of the uh, event that had happened where some of the terrorists that had links to Iran uh, had been killed in a bombing, especially one that was a leader of their military in Iran and so on, not, not the leader, but one of them, and, and other things that were part of that. But you've, if you paid attention to the news this past week, uh, this, was, this was real, because what we now have is not just you know, them dealing with the, the people that are living inside their own country, their own territory, and so on, and the different factions that are, that are involved with what has been going on with the terrorists and the, so on the last six months, and now... We turn around and, and we've got Iran sticking their nose into the business, and I don't know where it goes from here. But here's what I loved about it. Okay, a few things. Like that. Number one, um, it, it certainly it certainly was cool to see the fact that they sent. Well, in fact, let me just go to this slide right here. Over 300 ballistic missiles and drone missiles were launched from inside Iran's border, and they flew, they've launched them over top of Iraq and over top of you know Syria and so on, and and into the nation of Israel, which is. That's, that's about as close to being a war that, you know, you fired a shot and we, we fire back as it can be, except for the fact virtually everything that was fired at Israel was intercepted before entering the country's territory, according to the IDF. And it was reported that there was very little damage from the attack. One sad thing was when they shot them down, and they shot them down with the anti-ballistic, you know, uh, devices and so on, that to be honest with you, the United States has pretty much provided to Israel, that's where, where they got the, uh, the weapons that they used to protect themselves, part of, the, part of the way that we have supported them over the time. But that you can see in the picture here, th those lights are, are after there has been impact, and, and drones and, and ballistic missiles and so on that have been fired were all shot down. I say all shot down, they say 99%. And I don't know where the 1% went, apparently it didn't do anything that, that was worth reporting in the news and so on except for the fact that it was one seven-year-old girl who was killed by shrapnel, which is sad. And that certainly is something that for that family and even for that nation and so on, that means something. But the bigger picture is this, is that the demonstration of this was, was such to, to say 
two things to me. And this is my ears watching the news. I'm not, I'm, nobody asked me to give them my opinion. But I'm going to do it anyway. All right, number one, my, my opinion on this, number one is this, is isn't it cool that this kind of technology exists in order to protect from people that are attacking. I like that. I mean, I like this very much. And I like the fact that we are supported Israel, in, you know, as far as this weaponry is concerned, or anti-weaponry. And uh, it, it, it's certainly something we ought, we ought to tip our hat to. The second thing piece of two is, is this. Is, this is where my second coming Bible knowledge and all this kind of stuff and going in my own personal interpretations. It's not doctrine here at this church. But one of the things my opinion is, is that the closer we get to the end, the hotter it's going to get over Israel. Because Israel is going to be the focal point. The way I read the Revelation and other scriptures and so on, they're going to be the focal point of the world as far as news is concerned. And it's going to be red hot of people that are going to be trying to destroy them. And of course, once if you believe in the rapture as I do that will precede these kinds of moments and so on, after that, I mean, literally it all breaks loose and, and the, the Antichrist is involved and, and everything else that you can imagine. There's all kinds of different interpretations about there's a, a, a fake peace that happens. And, but the point is, Israel is going to be in the headlines in the last days. It's almost for sure. I mean, that's, that's the way the Bible seems like it leaves us. And you say, okay, we already know that. So, and except for the fact that every time I see this get escalated, because this right now, when you have a country that has, that has nukes, like Iran does, and, and, and when you get that and the other weaponry, they'll be able, they can deliver the damage. We now know that they can deliver. They've got the ability to do it and also the ability to shoot them down as long as they're not nuclear warheads. Can you imagine what that would be if that was involved? And you keep adding all the other issues of this that are side things. And my personal interpretation is we're getting really close. I mean, I just believe that we're living, in, and we're on the doorstep to the return of Christ. And uh, all, that, all that brings me back to this one point. That every time I see this, this, this graphic that shows a, a true picture of what was going on over top of this country, of God's chosen people who, by the way, if they don't know Christ as Savior, are lost. They are not saved if they are not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they've had to give their heart to Christ like all of us had to do. But these people are still part of, under a covenant from God, and God is going to protect them to the end. And these people will be, the Jews are going to be involved in last day events. And I, I always immediately tune into this. I mean, you've, you've heard me say this before, but the, you can actually do it yourself. If you don't have the address, we'll send it out again. But you can go, and on the days that it works, some days they've been shutting it down lately for whatever reasons. And, uh, but this is a live shot. This is not live right now, but it was 5 o'clock this morning. I took that picture off, a screenshot off my computer. And it shows you the western wall of the, of the foundation of the old temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. And this, this wall and so on is the only place really that Israel has access to anything that used to, used to have anything to do with the temple mount and with, of course, the temple of, of God that, that stood on, on this property. And they can't go inside because the Muslims took over over the years. And so when peace was made back in the in 47 when they moved back in and also in 65 and all these different peace treaties they've done, they have pretty much been told by the United Nations and so on. They've been told, you, you, you've got the country, you've got the city, it's all under your control, Israel, except for the Temple Mount. It still belongs to the Muslims because they built these holy places, this Golden Dome, which is part of the... <laughs> Of, of the story of, of Muhammad, who is there, Jesus. And Muhammad, of course, this is the place where he was raptured from the earth and taken up to, to glory, and he was taught by Allah, uh, truths and deep-seated th deep, deep, uh, uh, doctrines and so on, that he was then sent back to earth, and this is where he ascended back down to the place where that gold dome is, the, the, the rock that, that is inside of it is the very place where his feet left the ground and came back, according to their story. And, uh, and so, therefore, this is protected territory. And this is really the hottest of hot as far as the, the territories is concerned. And I, I, and I see this, and, and we're standing there at Jerusalem, and we're looking across the way, and where Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, that second summit, that's where he left the earth and went back to heaven and so on. And someday I'm going to come back, and my feet are going to the earth, and I look across from the Temple Mount. If you look at the cross from the Temple Mount, that where it says the Mount of Olives, center peak, that's it. That's where Christ took off to heaven, and that's where he's going to come back. And right there from this place where it's God's holy people. And I love this camera angle that you can look at, because I look at it, and I stare at that spot, and I keep saying, come on, Jesus, do it right now. I want to see you. I want to see you hit the ground. I'm, going to look, I'm watching this right here, because I'm, I'm focused on the idea that during my lifetime, I think that we'll see this. So I'm saying this for one reason. 
This is what, when I, what I get out of the news, and it, it's, it's unsettling and settling at the same time. Because I'm unsettled by the fact that I don't like war, and I don't want things to be escalated, and I want people losing their lives, and all this stuff, I, I, I grieve about it. And the people that are suffering inside the, the zone there where, where that, that has been pretty much cordoned off as far as support and help for so many months, and now it's, it's, it's much more civil as far as the treatment is between the, the terrorist part and, and, and Israel. But, but the point is, the, the, this situation that we're seeing going on live and in color, it unsettles me a little bit, and then it settles me for this reason. God's still in charge. And it's like everything is just falling into place, and I can't not say that when I look at war all of a sudden going from here to there. And they're shooting missiles over top of Iran, and from Iran, I should over top of Iraq and over Syria and Jordan and into the territory where God's people are, and not one of them essentially lands. They're all shot out of the sky. That wasn't the United States, and that wasn't their anti handcraft. That was God doing his protective thing because he promised he would protect them until the end. That's his covenant. And I think he's going to keep his promises. What do you think? I think absolutely he is. Okay. Anyway, is that more than you wanted? I don't care, because I wanted to say that to get us started. Now, that takes us now into where our lesson is going to be today, and we, got, we still got a good piece of time, so I didn't mess it up too bad there. No, we're good. All right, so we're doc talking about doctrine, so we want to get you into the, into the mood, and you say, oh, doctrine, let's get out of here. Well, if that's how you feel and so on, you don't like God's Word. If you like God's Word, if you love the Word of God, then you like the conversation we're having, because what we're trying to do is to determine what is truth? Jesus was in conversation with, with Pilate, you know, and, and what is truth is what Pilate said. Because he heard that Jesus referring to himself and also others are referring to him as being the truth. And, and it was a confusing point. And a lot of people today are confused about what is truth. And what is truth is not something that anybody in this room, including Danny Spanauer. And? And me too. Yes. <laughs> we do not have an insider information on exactly for sure, everything that is truth. We can only express that which we have learned over the years and think at this point. And there's some things that are big rock things that I am positive we got it right. And there's some things that are small stones that are room for discussion points. And here's the thing. When it comes to doctrine, here's the deal. Determining what God wants us to believe is not always easy. You think, yeah, it is. It's black and white. No, no, there's some things that are black and white and easy to understand. But determining all the things God wants us to believe is not always easy. And that was especially true, think about this, that before 1500 AD, most people did not have a Bible. Now, I want you to stop and do some imagining here, okay? Let's imagine. If somehow Satan was given power by God, he'd have to turn, turn, turn this over for him to do it. If somehow Satan was given permission and, and, and the power and he did this, he was able to destroy and ban every copy of the Bible in the world. Nothing that you could have on your phone or your computers, nothing that you bought and you got it sitting on the shelf and those would all be confiscated and every one of them would disappear and there would not be one person on this earth suddenly that had a Bible. And all we've got is what we've memorized and what maybe we have taught somebody else and they've sort of memorized and then you can see that the, the dilemma would be, what would be the impact of not having God's word? And the answer is? It would be chaos to start with and then I think it would degress because I think after this generation, then if, if all we could give the next generation is what we remembered and then it just seems like it would progressively Spiral downward and off we go. Within a hundred years from now, yeah. anything goes. I mean, that was pretty, pretty much it because there would be people that have been true to the word and they remembered the right and they've been taught right, they've been practicing right and, and being able to keep somewhat pure. But, but by and large, as far as the world is concerned, and the world already is crazy with chaos when it comes to doctrine and also beliefs in all kinds of gods and so on, the world would become pretty much pagan in their religious beliefs except for a shrinking Minority. Now, God would never let this happen, okay? But the thing about it is, is this one. He did for 1,500 years. From the time that Jesus Christ died, rose to the grave, ascended to heaven, sent his spirit, the disciples were given the Holy Spirit and they were given the challenge, go out and spread the word, the truth. 
teach doctrine is what they're doing. They're teaching the doctrine of grace and mercy and love of God and all those things. They go back and, and preach the truth, preach the word. And they were preaching it, and the only way anybody could determine if they're telling the truth or not is if they listen and say, that sounds like truth. Oh, no, wait. They also were able to validate it with not only gifts of the Spirit to be able to speak the truth and, and be given knowledge and so on, but also they're working miracles. And the miracles they're working are validating the truths that they're teaching, which means people say, well, obviously this is from God. It's like Jesus. Nobody could speak like you speak, Jesus, Nicodemus told him. And nobody could be like you, Jesus, and walk the way you are. The, 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 the Roman soldier at the cross said, surely this man was the son of God. And all he had was that one snapshot of Mount Calvary and the way Christ went through death. And he knows this is a God. This man is truly the son of God as he claimed and so on. That, that, that's the, that, that was the way it was validated in the first months and years as far as it's concerned. But here's the problem. If you lived not in Jerusalem, if you lived in Samaria, if you lived in Turkey, if you lived in Rome, the further you got away from the home base, the less resources there were. Now, they were, there were copies of the letters that were written by the Apostle Paul and others, and, and of, of the Gospels and so on. There were copies that, 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 of, of the original documents that were written down and, and passed around. So there were some copies of the Bible or, or the truth that were spread around, but they didn't have it all bound in one volume. They didn't have all the history of the Old Testament to, to compare it to. And think about all the resources we can have on, on, online right now of commentaries and, and, and listening to somebody. If you want to, you can listen to a video today of one of the best Bible teachers you can think of in the whole country. You can listen to them teach on a topic that you choose. All these resources of learning, and they didn't have any of that. All they had was that they heard the truth, they believed in it, they had faith in it, they followed what they were told to do in order to be right with God, and then they started trying to live like they were being told that they should do. They didn't get, get a home and so on of them and, and have a little, let's study God's word. Everybody open your Bible to John the 14th. They didn't have that, but we've got that. But they didn't. Why do you think the impact would be? It would be tough. That's the reason why over the years, Smart people, at least they thought they were smart. Sometimes they were and sometimes they weren't. Smart people who were religious leaders started doing things. Like, for example, they wrote down creeds. And the word creed is to believe. It, it, it is a summation of, part of for what they believe and also a summation of what they think that you should believe. And what you should believe became a product of that because it was decided by religious leaders. We'll get to that in just a second. And the Apostles' Creed is sort of like the Nicene Creed that we read together out loud, and we're not going to do that one again today. We're just going to look at this. But the Apostles' Creed is a shortened version that was pretty much something that was done and, and has been adopted more by the Protestant world than certainly than, than the Roman Catholic world. Because the Apostles' Creed says this, and I'm going to let Danny read it and so on. You got it, sir? Take it All through. Right. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, one. creator of heaven and earth, Two. and in Jesus Christ, Three. his only Son, our Lord, Four. who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Five. born of the Virgin Mary, Six. suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, Seven. died and was buried. Eight. He descended into hell on the third day, and descended to hell. On the third day, he Four. rose again from the dead. There's 10. He ascended into heaven, 11. and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, Twelve. Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. Thirteen. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Fourteen. The communion of saints. Fifteen. The forgiveness of sins. Sixteen. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Seventeen. And I just, Amen. And I, I, I counted as I went through this, 17 doctrines that are taught in the Apostles' Creed or ref, referenced in the Apostles' Creed, and that you might be able to get more out of it and so on. It's not a sacred number. I'm getting this point. That creed was given for people to memorize because it's not 87 chapters long and having all this words that you couldn't understand. It was written in simple terms and it was expressed in simple ways. And if you've been taught and led to Christ and you have some foundation of faith in light of the stories of Jesus, then these verses the, the, these stanzas make sense. And I don't want to go back and talk about he descended to hell and all this sort of thing. Don't, we're not going there. What we want to say is this one point. This is what they did. They gave them, gave them something people could memorize. And if someone would say, well, what do you believe about Jesus? Well, let me tell you what I believe about Jesus. I believe, that, I believe in God, the Almighty Father, the creator of the heavens and the universe and so on. And Jesus Christ was his, his son, our Lord, who was, was conceived of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he was born of a virgin. 
And he went through life and so on, and he was perfect, he never sinned and so on, and he suffered under Pontius Pilate. In fact, they, they condemned him to be crucified even though he was innocent, and, and he died, and they buried him, and he was gone, except he wasn't gone, because on the third day, he rose from the dead. You could take this, if you had it memorized, and you can repeat the story that saves us. And you can preach it to other people and testify to other people and so on, these points, which is why it was handy to have the Apostles' Creed. Because pretty much I, I agree with everything in there and so on, and there's a couple of things I would want to say, well, you have to understand what they're trying to say here or maybe how I interpret that. But by and large, this is something that's, that's healthy. It is not unhealthy to write down your beliefs and teach your beliefs to other people. It's not unhealthy. It's a good thing. We do that in Sunday school. We do it in worship service. When we preach sermons from the pulpit, so many times they'll take a passage and they'll kind of exegete it and they bring about all the truths that are hidden inside of it and, and the history of it and things and what it means and how it applies. And, and that's a good thing. It's healthy. But we always have to go back to this one point. The only truth that is truth is God's Word. And everything else that is said, whether it's Matthew's sermon or anybody else, the Bible talks about testing, testing the things you hear. And how do you test something if you're just Joe in the pew? And the answer is, you take the Bible, you take what they're saying, and you match them up. And if they are congruent, they're, they're matching, and they're, and they're equal, they're on top of each other, then this is truth, and you, and you can walk with it. And this is something we should always do with anybody that preaches or teaches and so on. You have the power with God's Word to test it. But people in the past did not, which led to and left open the door for chaos. This is the way I look at this, and this is, this is our collaboration here, that the doctrine of most Christians is determined by four things. What you believe and so on is determined by four things. And when we say doctrine, we're talking about our faith, things we believe about God and our relationship with Him and so on, and then practice, which also is belief, but it's faith that is demonstrated by the actions we do, like worshiping and obeying the laws of God and his truths and so on, and, and not sinning and so on, and, and serving others and loving others and so on. This, this is the practice of the faith. And so the doctrine that we should be doing and so on should be determined by truth. Well, how do people determine truth? And I, I'm going to let you take it from here for a second, okay? So here's, here's the first two points that go together on how people determine truth. And I think this just makes sense if you think through it. And we're realizing here, both of us grew up in Christian families. And so if you didn't grow up in a Christian family, your story may not match this. But for us, this is how we learned our faith and our practices, which is our doctrine. Number one, what do my parents believe and teach me? All right, when I grew up, my dad was from the Methodist Church, my mom was from the Church of Christ. And they said when they got married, they would go every other week. And then when kids came along, they finally said, all right, we gotta pick one, we gotta settle down on one. And so they settled at the Church of Christ. And oh, there it is, Jefferson Church of Christ. When I grew up, it was Jefferson Church of Christ. Now it's called Jefferson Christian Church. Mm -hmm. And it's right outside of Rural Hall, almost near King. It's kind of King, Rural Hall, Tobaccoville, the mini triad. You know, that's where, that's the hub of the world for me. So that really? tells you, that's my world view. Ground right zero. There. That's, all things, that's yeah. Actually, it's not ground zero. Trivia. You know where the highest point in Forsyth County is? Let me take a wild guess. A half a mile from right there, in between Rural Hall and King and Tobaccoville at 1,100 feet on Jefferson Church Road, about a half a mile up from there. So it's the highest point for Scythe County, Bob. Closest to heaven, is that what you're Well, to I didn't want to say anything, uh, okay. but King, Rural Hall, Tobaccoville, the mini triad, here we go. Okay, I get that. Everybody yeah. salute. <laughs> There's one of us. All right. Woohoo. Here we go. Anyway, so my parents, that's what I grew up. And so we grew up, and my parents, my uncles, when I grew up in this church, I had uh, eight uncles, or no, wait a minute, seven uncles on my mom's side, and there wasn't a Sunday that I can ever remember, all the way from birth to college, because we used to track it, that, that one of my uncles wasn't serving at a table or doing something on the service. And so my family was a part of this, and so that's just, we were indoctrinated, we were, we were Church of Christ. Did you have any opportunity to believe anything other than what the church and your parents uh, were teaching? No, not at all. And if you did, you got the strong arm of the fellowship of well, any one of my uncles or whatever across your head. But you. that's just what they believed and that's what, now and the funny part of this is, some of it now that I look back, I don't know if it was all them, but they obviously they gave me the basis for it. But then some of it I grew into. I remember growing up, we were very strict, very kind of, uh, we, didn't, we didn't talk a lot about grace. 
You know, it was kind of one of these things where if you sin, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, God, God's gonna get me. Almost a ping pong theology of God loves me because I went to church this morning. Oops, I said a wordy dirt, God doesn't like me now. And it's kind of that ping pong theology. And I didn't remember a whole lot of grace. It may have been taught and I just missed it. But as I grew up, I've learned more and more that it's not, you know, one little thing that's gonna separate you from God. But growing up, I just remember very, in a way, I was at the tail end of this you know, the, the Bible thumping kind of Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, 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 sinners in the hands of an angry God, you know, if you die tonight where you're going, you know, all that kind of stuff. I grew up with that kind of preaching and we used to have a crusade around here and it lasted about a week. What was it called, Judy? Northwest, it was at Northwest School, but it was, it was for a whole week, all the churches in this area would go there and it was every night, the gospel lads would come and sing and then we had preaching and it was bang the pulpit kind of preaching, and that's what I grew up with. And, I mean, it's stuck. I do remember this. Here's the, this confession's good for the soul. Oh, yeah. At one of these crusades, I remember the evangelist, whoever he was, came by with our preacher in the afternoon and said, Danny, you're old enough now. You should be baptized and all that. Tonight, when we have our invitation, we want to see you down front, okay? And I was like, uh, and all that. And I remember saying to my dad, Dad, if I can rake leaves tonight, I'll stay home. And my dad let me rake leaves. And I remember this. I'll, I was raking leaves and I saw the preacher ride by. And I want to go, mm. <laughs> Like, you're not going to tell me to come down front. But I, anyway, that was what we grew up and it stuck. I mean, that's so Church of Christ is just everything I've always known. I was born on a Sunday. I was in a Church of Christ the next Sunday. So literally, it's been there. So my parents, my extended family, they taught me the basis of what I believe. And do I still agree? As I've grown up, I think I've learned more and moved a little more um, from the strict strict to, um, I think, a better place. Um, here's a funny, and my mom's watching, so I have to be careful when I say this. Hi, Mama. Yeah, I know. Hey, Mom, I love you, and I'm not telling on you right now, but I can't even look at her. <laughs> but I remember when Mom came down here, uh, and we had a baptism, and our teens clapped. You know, our teens kind of started that. They went to a youth rally and came home, and so now when we have baptisms here at Pinedale, you know, everybody claps, and it's celebrating, and we should because our teens brought that to the church. But I remember mom afterwards said, do y'all clap at all baptisms? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, we do clap at all baptisms because when I grew up, as soon as you were baptized and came out of the water, now I belong, I belong to, to Jesus. Jesus. You had to sing that song to everybody. And if there was eight people being baptized, one would go down and one would come up, now I belong to Jesus. And then the second one would go down and come up, now I belong. You had to, after every one, that was kind of validation, but that was through tradition. And so when my mom came down here and we were clapping, it was just different and nothing wrong with it. But so we move, and I think we can move on some of the things that we've been taught, but the big rocks, it's all there, that's for sure. All right, now, I, I, I like what you did with all this for, for this reason. You, you, gave, you gave the foundation. How many of you, by the way, in, whether it's the Christian church or some other church, grew up in that kind of an environment where you had parents that taught you and you went to church and by the time you were a 12 year old and beyond and so on, you'd been schooled and you knew the Lord or, or had a pretty good handle on things and so on. How, how many of you like that? I know I was that way. A lot of hands. So there's a lot of people that were raised to, to, uh, in faith, which I like and so on. And it doesn't have to be the same, same church and so on, but you, were, you certainly were started out the right direction. I appreciate that very much. And I, I, all I want to say is this one point, is that when it comes to parents, one of the reasons why uh, that we, I put this in here and I was thinking and underlined these two words, parents and congregation leaders, is for this reason. The responsibility of not just parents, but grandparents. We can put your name in there. Big time. Grandparents relatives and so on, should also be involved in the feeding of truth, the example and also the words and so on of encouragement to, to, to young people, that, are, that your grandkids and great grandkids and whatever it is and so on. So that's a bit important piece. And also congregation leaders, the, the, the more you are a congregation leader, it almost doubles your ability and authority over the family that you have at home and so on. And see, anyway. For me, yeah, for me, both of the, those were the same. The, my parents and my family were the congregational leaders. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I had the same story. I mean, as, yeah. as we've talked about it and so on. I grew up in Chillicothe, 
for Ohio for a little while at Bridge Street Church of Christ, and that's what it looked like. I'm in that picture somewhere. And also below is what it looks like today. They've torn it down. They've built another building. It's a nice-looking building and so on. It looks like they're about the same size as they were. I also then we moved to Portsmouth, Ohio when I was in the second grade and until I was a junior in high school. That's the church we attended. It's where I was baptized and, and, and other things and so on that, were, that formed my faith. And, uh, and the, the thing about it is, uh, they've torn the thing down. In fact, it was, I, I, looked, I went up to Google Maps, and whenever they went by, and, you know, they take these pictures of all the, this is what they've got, and so on. They got, <laughs> they got the places. Just, I want to go get me a brick. I want to. I'm sorry, want Billy. To that is, yeah. Oh, by the way, I lived in Portsmouth, Ohio, and one of the things when I was searching for these pictures and found them pretty easy, also from Portsmouth, I got this. Krispy Kreme donuts. I remember this was right, category to, to, to you're saying, they don't spell it right. Do you see that, Danny? I know. We're KK. That's not. <laughs> right, and I want you, this is what I want you to know. True story. Wait a minute. The original, that's not the original. Wait a minute. What's the map? What, what's the date underneath of it? 19 and 29. You know what time, what, what, what year that Krispy Kreme with the K's started? 1934. They were thinking about it in 1928. They might have been, but they didn't do it yet. And that's the reason why the best donut in Ohio. No, it's not true. I just remember that. Was, okay, get off that. Let's get back to the point. So, so there's another thing that comes in. This is the aspect that brings in what the churches teach. You know, back up. I thought this was what you, the point you were going to make here was about false doctrine <laughs> or something. Hey, you got to be careful. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, I, I, part of my problem right here is Krispy Kreme donuts. Right, it doesn't we, matter if it was Portsmouth or here. Well, all right, right, let's get going. Okay, okay, let's keep going. Sorry. All right, now, what does the, the, what's our, our denomination teach? And we, you, you already know this is a non-denominational church. So keep that in mind as we talk about this. The churches that are like us and so on. Because Danny and I grew up in three different states apart from each other and so on. And yet, I had the same doctrine that was taught to me and so on as he had taught at Jefferson. I mean, I had the same experience. Because we had things in common where it came to where our preachers were trained and, and, and so on. There was, there was a, a likeness in our, what we call it, our brotherhood, brotherhood, I should say. Kind of, of funny, churches. we call it a brotherhood and yet we call them our sister churches. Yeah. So, a brotherhood and our sister churches. That anyway. is true, isn't it? Huh? It is. Yeah. Right. That's my, the smartest thing I ever heard you say. I, I'm just, I just, <laughs> well, when we got on donuts, my brain kicked in and just, I started slobbering a little bit. You stunned me, man. You, <laughs> that's, you've been hiding stuff. I know. It's like a family. Here we go. Brotherhood, sisterhood. We're all good. <laughs> okay. Anyway, but the, what a denomination teaches and so on can be very influential. And you would know this better than, than we would know it if you've had this experience, that you grew up in a church with your parents, your congregation was the, the, uh, your loved ones and so on, and that's where you were formed. And then later on, whether it was because of marriage, whether it was because you moved to another town and so on, you went to a different kind of church. And so you were raised, let's, let's say you were made, raised Methodist and you went to a place and there was not a Methodist church, you know, this city that was any, worth anything, but there was this Presbyterian church or a Baptist church or whatever, and you started attending it. And when you started attending that, then what the congregation leaders believed and taught was being fed to you, and also what the denomination itself said were the important points and the way that they handled communion and the way they did baptism and the way they did all kinds of different things all of a sudden became things that you were challenged with. And my point is this, is that doctrine, when it comes to this kind of situation, can change in you. Why should you ever change your mind? Well, let's keep moving here. What did I do here? I did something wrong. No, you're good. I next one, no, next I, I, gets actually, I don't have the, uh, I won't skip that. Let's go to this one right here. This is what I want to do. I'm looking at the clock. I got you. All right. What do I, in my heart, personally believe and practice is what it all comes down to. Sooner or later, you have to reach the point where you are able to assimilate in your own heart and life what it is you've come to decide that you ought to believe. And this approach to doctrine, these four points, is the reason why people's faith and practice and churches, even denominations themselves, change over the course of time. What was believed, uh, I'm going to use again an example, what was believed by a Methodist, say, because we, we talked about this last week a little bit, what was believed by the Methodist church 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, what it believes today, in some churches, not all of them, because a lot of them are protested because they're opposed to what we talked about last week, but it changed over these years, and it's changed in a lot of other people's lives. Let's not just pick on that one denomination. It's changed in everybody's churches to some degree. Even in this one, we've had, we've had a, 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 have discussions and so on that have to do with the, the new sexuality and rules and all the things that goes with this. And the approach to doctrine over the years and the faith and practice that a church does 
And the faith and a practice that you and yourself, yourself have a person decided to do can change. And sometimes it was good change. Sometimes it's not good change. Which is where we take ourselves to the point. You see, the Bible gives us the parameters of doctrine. But then it's up to us to figure out God's will. When I say us, it starts with me individually. I am responsible for myself. I'm also, because I'm a daddy, responsible to my family. Also, because I attend a church, forget about I'm a preacher, I'm a, you know, I attend a church, I'm a member of the church, and, and so the leadership of the church it has, has to be on. There's a lot, of, a lot of different levels here that gets involved when we start using the parameters of doctrine, but figuring out what God's will is. And we're not going to read all these, okay? We're just going to reference them and so on. But from the book of Acts, which we consider to be the, the, the photograph of, of what we should be today. Some, uh, some, somebody else coined this phrase, and I like it, and you've probably heard it before, that a river is, is purest at, it, at its source. And as it flows along, it gets polluted. But its source up in the mountains, you, if you've ever come in in the mountains and you saw a, a spring coming out of the ground, you could put your cup up there and take a drink, and it's safe because, almost without exception, because of the fact you're, you're at the source as far as the river. Well, the same thing was true with God's Word and the Gospel. It was pure on the day of Pentecost and the days that came right after that. Because the people at that point were practicing their faith based upon what they had learned from Jesus, what they were getting fed from the Holy Spirit's inspiration and of course the gift of the Spirit that was coming down. At the same time, they also were going through persecution, which the trial of your faith works strength and patience as far as your faith is concerned. So there was all these things that were emboldening them and, and causing the, the early leaders and also the members of the church and so on to get along strong. Except for the fact they came up with controversies. And let me just give you a few examples. Number one in Acts 4, and we're not going to read the passage on this. I left it out on purpose. I told Danny it was, we would do this. For this I'll send reason. this out because I know it's a lot of words. I'll send it out. Yeah. But, but civil disobedience, Peter and John work a miracle in the temple. This is shortly after the church has started, and there's all this controversy going on in Jerusalem. And they get arrested. And they say, you got to quit preaching and so on. They won't do it. So they get beat up and so on. They get called before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin says, you better do this because we'll do to you what we, what we already have done to the guy that led you into all this mess, Jesus. You remember what we did to him and so on. And, and, and Peter's comment and so on at this point, and, I, and I'm getting this off my phone here on the scripture. It's in Acts the 4, verses 18 and following. It said, they called him in again and said, commanded to them not to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus again. And Peter and John are standing there, and they reply, well, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? God's word or your word? You get the picture? That's Bible, only they don't have a Bible in front of them. Well, you be the judge is what you think is best, but I'll tell you what, I think, what we think. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We must speak, because that's not only what we are compelled by our own love, but also what we were commanded to do. And that didn't win them any favors and so on. They beat them up again and so on and kicked them out and said, next time it won't be so nice. Also, in Acts the sixth chapter in the church, there came up a controversy. The controversy was they had a mixture of people who had a background as Greeks and also a background of Jews who were widows, and they had to have a benevolence ministry to take care of them because of all the problems that were being created by selling out to Christ, and the church was having to deal with social welfare of their own body, people that were believers now, because they were being disbanded and discarded by their own families, much less society. And so the Greek widows were not getting the equal shares because after all, they came from Gentile backgrounds and they weren't really cared for equally and so on. And God sent down the word and said, this is not right and so on. And what they had to do was they developed the ministry of deacons. And the word deacons started is in Acts the sixth chapter when they appointed seven men full of the Holy Spirit to oversee the ministry of welfare to the entire body of people that needed, especially to widows and inclusive to anybody else and so on. This is a point of a controversy that had developed and they answered it and then left us an example that we follow today. A dollar club. There we go. And the ministry of deacons. And, yeah, the ministry of deacons and missions and yeah. I mean, it's a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of gospel preaching that's always done when it comes yep. to missions but also there's a lot of caring for people through, uh, through, through love and so on and then earning the right to be heard for the gospel. And I, I'm trying to say this one point on this. The word deacon means servant. And so that's the reason why elders in our church, 
We'll, we'll talk about the, the leadership someday. But eldership in our church, they are overseers and they have authority. Deacons in our church don't have authority. We don't have board meetings where they vote on how, what, what the church needs to do and so on. Deacons instead are a responsibility, not an authority, but a responsibility to love and to minister to people and to lead ministries of, of, of the hearts and so on, which is what they do. And we have a great team of deacons and people who are, who are women that are attached with it and so on. And all I can say to you is, is we have a ministry of welfare that is emulating what was done in Acts 6. So in other words, it's a doctrine. It's a doctrine of how you care for needs inside the church. Acts the seventh chapter, not the stoning of Stephen. You know, people, people came out of that saying, where, where was Jesus? And they had to scatter and run for their lives and so on because Stephen was stoned. And he was someone that stood tall for Jesus Christ. And he, what's, he, what's he get for it? What's he get for standing up for Christ? He gets stoned to death. And he dies. And his family is in grief. And the church is all, this is the first martyr, you know, as far as, and, and everybody's freaking out about it and so on. And they start running for their faith. And I'll tell you what, it created chaos in the church that they had to work for years in order to kind of bring it back the, the semblance of peace in people's hearts to understand this is what we're all called to, and here's why. And a lot of people said, if that's what you're selling me, I thought heaven was what you were selling me. If you're selling me this, a lot of people fell away if, as far as the faith is concerned. Now, my point's this, all these different ones, you can go read the stories of it and so on. Each one of them were controversies that did not exist in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. They did not exist in Acts 3 when after the 3,000 were baptized and the church is now continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread and prayer, fellowship, day to day, they're meeting together, breaking bread, and all these things that are going on in the body life of the church, they did not have any controversy. They were all on the same page. But time brings up challenges, and you, then also, you have to ask the question, what's God's will? And when you ask God's will, they didn't have a Bible. They had to follow what the Spirit was leading and what they determined, and their decisions were recorded, and now we follow the Bible. That's part of the doctrine that we follow. And I'm going back to this thing about the book of Acts, because I think when it comes to our doctrine and what you believe and I believe and so on, the place for us to always know that we're standing on firm ground is anything that Jesus taught during the four Gospels and whatever is displayed and followed in the book of Acts. That is the foundation of a church that has good doctrine. Now, what did I just do? I personally, because of that, I personally don't have much respect for denomination conventions that debate and come up with new doctrine, whether it's in the, the, the Catholic side of the aisle or whether it's in some of the Protestant church side of the aisle. I don't have much respect for that because I think God's word should be more, more perpendicular instead of <laughs> majority rules. Not I think really, it's not really debatable. God right. said it, let's do it. Don't really debate it. And if God didn't say it, and if he hasn't revealed it, then that shouldn't be a law. It shouldn't be taught. It ought to be something that's founded and, and based upon what is the teachings of Jesus. We have those in the four Gospels. What is the teachings of the Apostle Paul? Because he went through and, and churches that had problems and so on, and he, and he one by one dissected them and, and gave us, you know, insights into what, and also what is true, especially in the book of Acts, which is the actions of the Apostle in starting the church and what they were doing, we should be following. And if you do that, you're pretty close to the source of the water. You're getting it unpolluted. And that's one of the reasons why we emphasize this hard. If you ask us in this church what our doctrine is, you'll hear this again the next time we meet and teach. If you ask us what we teach in this church is our doctrine, the answer is what I just said. God's word, the example and teaching of Jesus Christ, and the book of Acts, or the teachings of the letters that took the church of Acts and explained the problems that they dealt, dealt with. And then Paul or James, or whomever else was a Bible writer, they gave us teachings, corrections, disciplines, encouragements, good things to do, bad things to not do anymore. They gave us these things, and that's what ought to be our doctrine. If you come to this church and ask us, has anybody ever done this? Have you ever walked, when you walked into Pinedale, did you ask, well, what does this church believe? 
Because I, I used to get to ask this all the time as a pastor, and I would go to people's houses, and I'd sit on their couch with them and so on, and we'd drink a, you know, a, a, an iced tea or whatever, and, and we would start having a, a conversation about, who is Pinedale? What do we believe? And when I would go back and do these kinds of things and, and talk about this in more simplistic terms, and when I would give them this kind of, this kind of an encouragement, they were encouraged because this is what I always said to them. And this, I'm, I'm going to make a point that we aren't going to get to today, but I want to make this point. All right, is that right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of nudging you off the, the ledge here. Right? I'm, seeing, I'm seeing me going off the edge. We're okay. Good. Okay. All right. We call ourselves in this church Christian. How many of you were ever in your life a member of a Presbyterian church? Raise your hand. How many of you were ever a member of a Baptist church? Raise your hand. Oh, there's a lot of them around. What, how many of you were ever a member of a Methodist church? How many of you were ever a Catholic? Okay, I could keep going. I'm, I'm going to run out of churches at some point, Lutheran, Episcopalian, whatever. doesn't matter. Now, this is what I want to say to you. When, you, when people said, well, what, what do you believe? Or, or where do you go to church and so on? Was your identity, well, I'm an Episcopalian. Or was your identity, I'm a child of God, born again by the blood of Christ, I've been saved. That's who I am. And the answer probably was, in short order, well, I go to Pinedale or I go to whatever church, and then the assumption is what they believed is what you believe. I would suggest to you, and I used to suggest this to people all the time, however you were raised, you'll always have a little bit of that in you. If you especially if you were raised a Catholic in the Northeast, you're, going to, you're always going to be a Catholic. And there's certain traditions and things like that and so on that are always going to be part of your. But also, when you were a Catholic, what also were you? Were you a Christian? And they always say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. Okay, well, here we go. We've already got a platform. It doesn't matter what your background is or even maybe some areas in your faith and so on that is different than who I am and what I believe. Here's one thing's for sure. At this church, we all stand on this one word, the word Christian. Because we think that is the unifying word. Right? Oh, I love it. I love the fact that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch because they were acting like Christ. It was almost like a nickname. It was like, oh, you're a Christian. You're a Christ-like person. You're a Christian. And it was, almost, it was a nickname, but it, it's a great way of, yes, I'm a little Christ. And I love the fact that what are you? I want to be acting like Christ. I want to be living like Christ. And I'm going to say a couple things here that I don't go, think is going to mess going. you up. But and it goes along with everything you're saying here. In our, and y'all have heard these before, but as our, as our movement was kind of getting started, our founders, Alexander Campbell, Barton W. Stone, all these guys, they had a couple sayings like, we have no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. No creed, so where's, where's your list of what you believe? Where's your list of who are you? We have no creed but the Bible. I mean, we have no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. They also said where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures silent, we're silent. And it's the same idea in essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, love. Say that again. In all things, charity. In essentials, in essentials, unity. Essential what? Big rocks. Jesus is God. The Bible is God's word. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus died on a cross for our sins. Jesus rose three days later. Big rocks, essentials. Think, things that absolutely positively, if you change those, then I can't be your let's brother fight. and sister If you Christ. change those, let's fight. If you take Jesus Christ and you lower him to where he is not God in the flesh, but he's just, well, someone God sent or a God, there's a lot of gods and so on. If you do that, then you and I are not on the same page. We, we call it. A lot of those churches cults when they when they take Christ. Well, the idea of uh, the, the definition of a cult is when you take Christ and make him anything less than God or under God. He was God's first created. He was a good teacher. He was a prophet. He was a if any uh, if you take him away from God from being God, then you're a cult. That's the definition. Of Tim's it. sitting up there. By the way, he'll be teaching in here next week. And Tim teaches a class here called Essentials, and the word Essentials is called that because that really is. The thing that we should be focusing on. We don't need to bicker over some of the things we used to bicker over too. It was the dumbest things in the world. But, but, but we, ought, we ought to be focusing on what are the ro big rock doctrines and so on that we all agree on. And when we get into that, it doesn't matter what church you've come from. 
by the time I would leave somebody's house back in the day when I do this, they'd say, I love Pinedale, don't I? I'd say, yeah, because you're never going to change on some of the things you believe, but this is what you do believe, and this is what we believe. This is why we do this. Come, be a part of our church. We take communion every Sunday. Here's why we do it, because we think the early church did. And we, we, and we would go backwards and, and, and dissect it that way, but pointing out the fact we're not saying you have to do it, we're not condemning the church that don't do it, but in this sense, you know, we're, we're, we're laying down the foundation for unity in the body of Christ that comes through dark doctrine. Doctrine is a four-letter word of division in most situations. A lot most of the time. time. It dirties, it dirties up the conversation, and I, and I appreciate it. By the way, the, the, the last one here on, on, in Acts, the 18th chapter, before we leave this, Apollos was somebody who was a, uh, going around and preaching and teaching and so on, and he was doing a great work. He was, he was touching a lot of people's lives so on because he was teaching them about Jesus. But also, he was doing it under the ministry of John the Baptizer. And so John the Baptizer was how he had been baptized, the baptism of repentance, and he was going around teaching the fact that, you know, so repent and so on. And, then, and, and he had not yet understood the baptism that was done in Acts, the second chapter, because those who had been baptized under John's baptism got baptized again because they got baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ into baptism, rising to walk the new life. That hadn't happened yet. So John's baptism was one that prepared the way of the Lord but the baptism that's practiced by the church today, no matter which denomination you want to talk about, we all look at that as the focal point of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which means there's a second baptism. And Apollos was called off to the side by two members of the church, Priscilla and Aquila, this husband and wife. And they said, we hear you're preaching and teaching and so on. Tell us something. How were you baptized? And he said, well, I was baptized like John the baptizer did out in the river and so on like Jesus. Yeah, well, that was good, except for the fact, and they told him, it says in the scripture, a more excellent way. I love that phrase. They told him the more excellent way. It was an excellent way. What John was doing, this is the more excellent way now. It's because, all, almost like, but wait, there's more. Yeah, because something, yes, and wait, so, there's more. And so Apollos then was rebaptized, changed the way he was preaching and teaching and so on. It was a point of doctrine there was a minor correction, but it was a correction that's nevertheless that allowed for the church to stay unified. Because it, what you're doing is great. It's a more excellent way. Let's, let's, let's add this to the thing because it's God's will and way. That's what in this church we kind of tried to say is the way to do this, is to try to somehow get on the same page. As we prepared for this lesson, we found a, a, a statement of core beliefs that we liked. Sums up big rock doctrines that we think God wants us in our church and personally and so on to, to, to believe in. And even better than that, it's a summary of what was included in the website for a Christian church down in, in Texas. Christian school. Christian, uh, Christian school. school. We, we just found this by random and so on. And Danny and I talked about it and so on and said, this, this really is worth reading. And this is kind of how we're going to wind our lesson down today. Because I, I love, love that picture right there. This is, what, this is a Christian school. This is their campus. It's a huge campus in Brentwood, Texas. It's not Brentwood, Tennessee. It's in Texas. Make sure you know that. And so on. That's, there's a big difference. And I want you to notice something on the core values of what they wrote. And to me, there's a big difference between a creed and a statement of faith. Because it's scripture-based is, 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 is the way that a statement of faith should be. And big rock doctrine issues should be the things that are emphasized. So let's just read this. There's seven different things. We don't have this on our website. We don't have, if you go to our website and look for what does behind L believe, we say, well, we'll be happy to talk to you about that. In their case, they put it down in writing, and I really like these. We're not going to have to read the scriptures part where or, or they're listed, but we can send this out too. Or, or I want to send you the link that will get you to this page. Yes, that's I can't perfect. send all these different slides out. Yeah, that's, but here we go. But it well, is like kind of cool. All right, so let's read them. These are seven things that they wrote down as core values, and I thought we could put this on our website, and I'd love it personally, except for one little point. Go big rocks. Yeah, big rocks. Here we go. Number one, we believe in the one true and living God. He is the creator and the sustainer of the universe who is all wise, all present, and all powerful. He is the ruler over everything and directs the affairs of men according to his eternal purpose. And all the people said? Agreed. Okay. Number, Number two, two, we believe that Jesus Christ is God's beloved son. Being in very nature God, he was present and active in creation. He lived on this earth, taught men to know the path of salvation, and was crucified for our sin in order to reconcile us with God. He was raised from the grave on the third day and ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God where he now intercedes with the Father on our behalf. We believe in his eventual return, his ultimate victory over Satan, his eternal reign. And all these scriptures goes with it and all the people said? 
Amen. Oh, wait, well, there's a lot of unity in this room, bud. Amen. Hey, let's see if we can keep going here. Number let's three. Let's roll. Number three, we believe in the Holy Spirit. He is, the, he is one with the Father and Son and lives within the church, individually and collectively directing our minds, giving us life, empowering us to confess that Jesus is Lord, testifying that we are God's children, and interceding for us in our prayers. It says a lot right there, but a while all the people said... Amen. I mean, I, I, I love this one especially because this is probably the one that we're weakest on of the three so far. We all believe in the Father, believe in the Son. We get to the Holy Spirit, and they're, you know, I believe that, and so on. And all I can tell you is those things are absolutely, in my opinion, essentials that you must believe about the Holy Spirit because they're taught in black and white, hardcore, black letter law, scripture, and so on. Number four. And not just his opinion. There's yeah. the verses, there's the oh, verses yeah. to back it up. You can read so, them yourself. Yeah. Number four, we believe that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. All of us have sinned, and our sin separates us from holy God. However, we are reconciled to God through Christ's sacrifice for us, causing our hearts to repent of our former, former sinful ways, to confess before men that Jesus is Lord, and to carry out our obedience in baptism by immersion. We are raised from the water a new creation, a creature, cre creature, a new creature, designed to carry out the works of, of service God has reserved for each of us and to grow towards the Christ-like character that he desires. I, I understand it's cumbersome a little bit and so on. I put in parentheses the word immersion because they said that and I put it in parentheses because there's something that somebody say, and all the people said, amen, except immersion. Or you have to be immersed. And that's a discussion point for another day. But the point of the matter is, the rest of this, I mean, we all, without even any question, would say, amen. Let's keep going. Five. Five. We believe that the Bible is inspired written word. Now this, by the way, this is important. Anything and everything that you know about God, Jesus, whatever, is 2,000 years old. Unless you have a Bible which makes it right now. With a Bible, here and now, in your lap, in your hand, you can read it, and it is now you reliving what is 2,000 years old history, as long as you trust that the book is what we're reading here. And if you don't trust that, then you've got no points of reference, so what do you believe? All you can say, well, I do believe in a God, but, but we believe that the Bible is the inspired written word. Keep going through. And five. some people have this one up first. And yeah. anytime you see lists like this, sometimes the Bible is the very first thing. Those are the other what do you learn from God and Jesus? And yes, but here we go. We believe that the Bible is the inspired written word. Through the Bible, God reveals his holy nature and the desire for a covenant relationship with his children. The Bible is a comprehensive and authoritative guide to right living and Christian conduct and outlines God's plans to reconcile all men to himself through Jesus Christ. All people said, amen. amen. The Bible is the Bible, no doubt about it. Six. We believe Jesus Christ established his church. His desire is for a unified community of followers who act as his ambassadors to carry the good news of salvation to all men and to serve others in his name. The church provides mutual encouragement to each other and assembles together to worship Jesus, our risen Lord, and God the Father. The ministry of the church and the existence of the church, the body of Christ. You are, when you become a Christian, you're a member not of Pinedale Christian Church. You're a member of His church. And we all believe in that, right? Amen? Amen. All right. Last but not least, number seven. We believe that Jesus Christ will return. A judgment of all men's actions and intentions will take place and those who have faithfully served Jesus will, through his grace and mercy, live with him for all eternity in heaven. And, and all people said? Amen. Except you shouldn't have said amen on this one. <laughs> There's one little word in there I don't like, okay? And we'll live with him for all eternity in oh, heaven. I don't think we live for eternity. You go to heaven when you die now, but a new heaven and a new earth is going to be created, and we're going to live on a new earth. That's where we're going to spend eternity and we'll have access to heaven, but Jerusalem's going to come down onto the earth, and Jesus is going to be reigning on the throne. And that's what, doesn't it say a new heaven and a new earth? So for me, doctrinally speaking, for me, I would have had to say for all eternity, and just hit a period, and that would have been fine, because I think maybe it's not just in heaven. We're going to heaven, and then we'll be, anyway. And right. plus, since it's you, if anything's written, you've got to find one thing. I know. Because that's just your gift. All right, Danny. That I, is your gift. I, I've, I've examined you for years, and I've got more than one on you. But on the I, Bible, that's, on, on, this, on this one, that's one word I have. One of your many gifts, Pastor. Point. Now, here's my point. Okay, we could put this on our website. If people read it and so on, it'd be nice to have somebody that was kind of making sure that they understood what this word meant, what this But I, I think that's a, a safe thing that could be on any church's 
website that's worth attending. I don't care if it's a Methodist, Presbyterian, Christian church, Church Christ, whatever. Anything that you've ever attended and so on, these points ought to be there. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And if you don't believe those kind of things, I say, what's going on with you? And the answer is false doctrine. This is the worst thing we can have is false doctrine. And it's time for us to pray it out here. I, I see the clock. But let me say this. False doctrine is not my opinion. False doctrine is when somebody teaches something that is contrary to God's opinion, which is the Word. That's why it is the Word. The Bible is a sacred point of celebration that we have to protect its integrity and we have to also buy into and defend it every way we can because if we don't, if we don't have the Bible, we don't really have anything other than, I hope so. I'm banking my life on it. I don't really know for sure. I know, I know for sure because God's Word says, and that's how we quote it. Right? Amen. All right. Let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the, 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 the conversation we've had here. And the, the, this point that we're saying is something that for many people in this room, it's, it's so old school for them that they've known it and known it and known it and known it, and they could have taught it. And there's some in the room and so on that are still learning and, and coming to understand what the heartbeat of this church is. We, we are not a perfect church, God. You know that better than we do. And I'm sure there's places where we stumble and err, and, and, and you'll explain things to us someday in eternity. I, I look forward to those conversations for sure myself. But I also know this much. We're standing on your word, and we, we embrace it strongly, not because it is magical, because it's your words. And it's in you, Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we find hope and salvation. It's in you, the Spirit, that's in our hearts right now that connects us to heaven and, and empowers us and enlightens us. And, and we need that and so on. And we also know that the promises that you have made through your word is what keeps us going sometimes. The world is tough. And we've, we've got some moments in our life, Lord, where we are living a, a hopeless you know, situation except for the fact by grace through faith, Jesus Christ, our Savior, we've given you our heart. And you've promised us, heaven's a coming, and I'm with you right now. We thank you and celebrate that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all have a great week.